In today's episode, we talk about how to use struggles to become stronger and live happier. My guest, Tracy Ferrin, is the best selling author of Upstruggle, Motivational Speaker, and Cancer Thriver. Her incredible story will help you find hope and strength in any struggle you are going through. She shares her story and how she started using struggles as opportunities to grow. She also shares her upstruggle formula, which helped her to identify the struggle and choose the best way to deal with it. So you can do exactly the same. Let's jump in into the episode and enjoy. Tracy, first of all, I wanted to say congratulations on publishing your book called Upstruggle. Thank um, you. I love the title, Embrace the Struggle, Become Stronger, Live Happier. Um, when I read this book, I, you know, I cried, I laughed. Um, it was everything and it's just like I love how you share um, openly a lot of things from your personal life but I think what is the most um, important part in this book is your inspiring story and how you chose to take the struggles and convert them into growth opportunities and how to turn them into um, into something that helps you to become stronger and, and live happier. So can you share with us, uh, first of all, what has inspired you to write this book and probably yeah. we'll touch upon the, your story? Yeah. So I, the thing that inspired me is I'm, I'm a heart girl, right? And so I think a lot of people stay in their head and mm -hmm. they, they work from their head and they live their life from their head. Mm -hmm. I try to stay in my heart and live my life from my heart. And so when something is put on my heart, I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I should probably do it. Um, so one, it was just, it was on my heart to do. I didn't know how. I have no form formal training as a writer. I didn't even know where to start. I just knew it was on my heart and I had to take action. Obviously, right? I figured it out, which when we yeah. take action, we figure it out. Clarity comes. Um, so it, not only was it on my heart, but then just all of the struggles I had gone through, especially at such a young age, I had just gone through so many things, but not only have I gone through them, but I've learned and I've grown and I kind of developed over the years, a formula that I was using to help me get through struggles. And so I was like, maybe I should share that. <laughs> maybe I should share that with others, you know, with the book. You know, I, I read lots of books. That's my bookshelf. Um, oh. And I know some books are really inspiring and I love that. But oftentimes I think what is missing sometimes is tangible tools, mm -hmm. right? I didn't want people to be like, yay, Tracy, like good for you, like way to go, which I think my book is inspiring, but I wanted to give them actual tools that I use to help me get from A to B. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And so um, that's really the book. Yeah. That's what inspired me to help others. <laughs> yeah. And I think we talked about this in our um, pre-call uh, two weeks ago that I believe that when we share our stories, how we overcame um, struggles, difficulties, challenges in our life, we can give hope and mm -hmm. we can give uh, a different perspective for others, mm -hmm. how they can deal with, uh, with whatever comes up in their life. Yeah. So, and that's what I, I, I found in your book and we'll dive a little bit deeper into the upstruggle formula. Uh, but before we go into that, can you, uh, share with us your story and what was really the, the beginning for, for this book? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's just part of my story, but I always call it my story because that was a struggle. I call it my ultimate struggle. Mm -hmm. That was a struggle that kind of has, has launched me into where I'm at today um, and is really a lot of why I am who I am, right? Mm -hmm. was, I think we all have an ultimate struggle in life. If you haven't, you will, <laughs> because yeah. we all do. Um, 
And so my, my story is, you know, when I was 18, I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer. Um, and not only was I diagnosed with cancer, I mean, if anyone knows anything about cancer, you know, cancer alone, that's tough, right? It's, it's, it's a tough disease. Um, but I was also married and I had a baby already and uh, I was pregnant. So not just having cancer, was it tough? But it's like, okay, now we've really complicated things. She's not, mm -hmm. you know, she's got, she's pregnant. It's not one life, it's two lives. And my doctors had advised me to terminate my pregnancy. And I just knew in my heart that my case, that that just wasn't necessary. And so I told my doctors, I'm like, okay, okay, well, that's not going to happen because I'm just, I'm, I don't feel like that is needed for my case. Um, so I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We are going to just wait. You know, I'm 18, right? Yeah. I don't know anything about cancer. <laughs> like, we're just going to wait. I'm going to deliver a healthy baby. And then, like, we'll touch base and we'll do this chemo thing, okay? And he's like, yeah, no. See, that's the difference in life and death. And I'm like, okay, well, that changes things. Um, well, <laughs> I'm still not going to terminate, but there has to be another option, right? There's always other options out mm -hmm. there. And so he was like, okay, look. Now, this was in 01. This was, pretty, this was a while ago. But he's like, we don't have any research. Uh, a pregnant woman undergoing chemotherapy in her first and second or second trimester who delivers a healthy baby. And I was in my second trimester. Mm. Um, he's, I was like, okay. But he's like, but if we wait to start chemo till the third trimester, the baby's survival is high. It most likely is that she'll survive but we still cannot give you any guarantee as to what complications she could have. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. So like we're getting somewhere. And um, thankfully though, and that was a plan that I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to have to go with that one because that sounds like the best option for everyone. Thankfully that was only three weeks away. That was only the difference. Instead of three months, <laughs> yeah. it was three weeks of a waiting period. So I hit my second or my third trimester um, and so we moved forward with that plan. And then I was scheduled to be admitted into MD Anderson on 9-11-01. And that was a huge, obviously, you know, day event and in our history. It was pivotal and changing for our country. And, you know, there our country was under attack and we're preparing to go to war. And here I am under attack and I'm preparing to go to war in a different way, right? I I'm have chills to... right now. That, that's what, I, when I was reading your book, it, that's what you actually said, that as our country is preparing to go to war, I am preparing to go to war as well for my own life and for my daughter's life. So that's... Yeah. The biggest battle of my life. That mm -hmm. was it. And I was preparing for it. Now, due to those events, the hospital's like, whoa, don't come in. Because we didn't know. Like, nobody knew anything, right? Yeah. Um, but because of my case, they couldn't wait too long. I ended up being admitted the very next day to start mm -hmm. my chemo. So I did my first round of chemo. And after my first round of chemo, my husband leaves. And it was hard. And I can, I can sit here today and I can talk through it. And sometimes I cry, right? Because the pain was real. And sometimes it, you're a woman. I'm a, we sometimes just get emotional, right? Yes, we just need um, to let it out. <laughs> And so it's like, I can sit here and smile through it now because I've healed, right? I've mm -hmm. worked through that pain, but that doesn't take away the pain that I felt all those years ago with him leaving me pregnant, sick and everything I'm going through. Um, but I have to move forward, right? I have, I have a life to save mine and my child. And so moving forward, um, I did a couple rounds of chemo with my daughter and my doctors wanted to take her as early as possible without any major complications to being a preemie. Mm -hmm. And so that was about six weeks. They're like, okay, we can take her safely at six weeks. So they did, they gave me like steroid shots to help with the development of her lungs and things like that. But um, literally every round of chemo that I did, except for the first one, after that first one. So the, the, lo the last couple of rounds of chemo that I did before I had her, it sent me into preterm labor. So I would have to hurry up and finish my chemo and then go across the street to another hospital and they'd have to stop my labor. Um, like the chemo would just induce me, you know, put me into preterm labor. So dealing with all of that, but finally it was time, six weeks, you know, early, it was time to have her. So there I was, bald as Mr. Clean, giving birth to a three pound, 10 ounce baby girl. I mean, she had a head full of hair mm -hmm. and she came out screaming. And the, you know, the reason why like the head full of hair was like, I, why I put that in my book is because 
I was bald and I was doing chemo. Mm -hmm. And usually a baby gets what the mom gets. That's just yeah. how it works. And so we all kind of assumed that if I was bald, she was going to be born bald. We honestly, we thought I was going to give birth to an alien. We just did not know yeah. what the baby was going to look like. We had no idea. And so when she comes out with a head full of hair, we're like, okay, that's weird. Why isn't she bald? Um, but then when she came out screaming, we're like, okay, her lungs are good. You know, she was, she was a completely healthy baby. She was just too tiny to send home. Mm -hmm. So she had to stay in the hospital just to get a little bigger because they don't send babies home that little. Yeah. Um, at right around five pounds, they sent her home. So while she was in the NICU, you know, putting on some weight and just eating bigger, uh, they gave me an entire week off. They're like, you can have a week off from having a baby. And then let's go do chemo again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My body just needs a break. But yeah. okay, I understand this is cancer. Um, so I go back and I do one more round of chemo. After that, um, I have, it's called limb salvage surgery. It was about a 13 plus hour surgery. Um, and it's just how it sounds, right? It was to save my limb. A lot of people with this cancer, they lose their limbs. It's very common to lose a limb with this cancer. And so um, I am fortunate enough that they were able to save my, uh, my leg. But it's the kind of surgery that's so intense, they have to bring in shifts, you know, nurses. And I woke up in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Um, so stayed there and, you know, and that was a hard recovery. The thing about when you have a surgery and you're on chemo is your body feels a lot slower than the average person. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the recovery was, was pretty rough. Like I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty rough. And so I just, I continue on with chemo and the more chemo that I did, the weaker I got. And mm -hmm. that was something I did not know. I did not realize. I remember when I first started and everyone knew I had cancer, everyone would look at me like an injured puppy. And I just remember thinking, why are y'all looking at me like that? Okay. Like, this is fine. It's no big deal. But you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And especially after that first round of chemo, I'm like, y'all, I just felt a little under the weather. That's it. And I'm like, if this is chemo, no big deal. Like, why is everyone looking at me like this? Mm -hmm. Well, Every round of chemo, you get weaker, you get sicker, you get, you have more complications. I mean, I had complications like mouth sores that were just so painful in my mouth and down my throat that I would rather not eat than have to eat because the pain was just too mm -hmm. intense. And which of course led to dehydration. It led to extreme weight loss, which landed me back at MD Anderson, you know, trying to hydrate me and trying to see how we can work with the mouth sores so I, I can eat. Um, you know, blood, blood transfusions, platelets, I mean, just kidney, we had to wait for kidney counts to come up. But I think the scariest moment through all of this, the mm -hmm. scariest moment for me was when I woke up one morning, and my motor skills were completely gone. And I just remember thinking, Oh, my gosh, is this the new me? Is are my parents going to have to take care of my children and raise them? Are they going to have to take care of me the rest of my life? Am I even going to be able to be a mother anymore? Because, I mean, no motor skills. It was hard. How would I, how would I go, you know, live and make a, a living and support and stuff? Um, and so went to MD Anderson's ER, saw, saw a neurologist, and we figured it out. He just kind of, they wanted to make sure it was nothing, you know, with the, the brain and everything. And showing me all these flashcards that you show like a two-year-old when you're trying to teach yeah. them hearts and colors and shapes and um, come to find out, I was just really, I was just overdosed on chemo. My body just needed a little bit more of a break than they were giving me. And so they just gave me some medication to kind of reverse it. And within about 24 hours, I was back to my normal mm -hmm. self. But that was just such a scary moment for me. Um, and then because I am so, I'm an honest person, you know, I'm transparent. And um, everyone's always like, oh my gosh, how did you get through it? And I'm like, well, first of all, I was 18. So my tools and my resources were very limited, right? As if I, yeah. you know, if I had cancer now, I'm a little bit more mature. I have some more tools in my toolbox. Um, but like, honestly, pain pills, like, I'm just going to be honest, you know, it's the pain pills. So because of my, my leg surgery being so intense and the pain from that, and this was back in 01. I had pill bottles with like a hundred pills in them just for me with pretty much unlimited refills. 
Now that is unheard of today in the States, which yeah. is not something they do anymore. But I quickly realized that those pain pills not only took away the physical pain, but it took away the mental and emotional pain. And so mm. I became addicted to my pain pill. That, I mean, just in all honesty, that is how I got through it because it was such a traumatizing experience for me. It was so hard and I was young, but yeah. that's what I did. That's what I did, you know? And I remember going to my doctor saying, because I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right. Yeah. I'm like, um, I'm addicted to my pain meds. Like, this isn't okay, what can we do? And he was pretty much like, girl, I don't care. I am just trying to save your life. And I get it, right? Big picture, big picture. He's like, we can deal with that later. And just me being me, I'm like, no, this bothers me. I know it's not okay. What can we do about this? I don't want to, I don't want to feel this addicted to them. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up putting me on something that would still help with the pain from the surgery, but it was less addicting. And then when the pain from the surgery um, was finally gone, I slowly weaned myself off like towards the end of chemo and everything. So, I mean, I just went through, and, and while I'm going through all of this and all these complications, my husband, I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through a divorce. Um, I'm living with my parents. They're having to take care of me. My mom gets fired from her job because she's spending too much time away, you know, taking me to and from the hospital. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was hard. It was a hard experience and struggle that I went through. Um, and so after all of this and all the complications, I finally went to my doctor and I said, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I can no longer do any more chemo because I could feel it slowly killing me. I knew I was dying. And I'm like, the chemo is going to kill me before that cancer ever does. You know what I mean? And people don't realize that about chemo is chemo is poison. Yes. Right. And you, mm -hmm. you're choosing the lesser evil really cancer or chemo. They're both terrible. Um, and I could, I could feel it killing me. And I just knew that if I finished out his treatment plan, which I believe was about two to three rounds of chemo left, mm -hmm. but what I mean, I was having just way too many complications and my body was not bouncing back so they, they could hit me again. And I said, I'm done. You know, there I am young again, having to make a tough decision, knowing that if I don't do those last couple of rounds, could my cancer come back? Do I really need them? Um, and having to take that risk, you know, but also feeling like in my heart that if I did not quit the chemo, I was going to die. So die or, you know, the risk of it coming yeah. back or really like knowing in my heart I was going to die. Again, I had to choose. And obviously, right, I made the right choice for me. And that's why I'm not an advocate for, yo, don't listen to your doctor. But you know what I mean? Because I, I listened to my doctors in the past, but I'm a huge advocate for we know our bodies better than anybody else mm -hmm. and that we need to listen to our hearts. And it, everyone calls it something else, your heart, your intuition, your gut feeling, the spirit. To me, it's all the same. We just label it differently. Exactly. Um, and I just, I say my heart because I kind of feel it here and it just feels totally different than when I'm in my head. And so I am a huge advocate for doctors are great and I love them and they saved my life, but I know my body better and mm. everyone knows their bodies better than the doctor. You know, we may not have the terminology to put on things. We may not know everything, but I really truly believe that our bodies are always speaking to us and giving us feedback and we just have to listen, yeah. you know, 100%. so that is really, that is my story that I open up with mm -hmm. in my book that is kind of the like the story because it was my ultimate cancer and it's really why I wrote the book why I'm doing the things that I'm doing is because of that you know that experience that I had in life and and that is you know when I was reading this book I was putting myself into your shoes and I I couldn't I couldn't imagine how would I cope with that and how would I act and how would I help myself? And I'm just curious to know that, well, what was it that helped you to use those struggles as opportunities to grow? I think in your book, you write this, um, you write this, I'm just a Texas girl who realized she could let her struggles take from her or she could take from them. 
So I'm just curious to hear from you when did this realization came to you and how did that change the trajectory of your life? Yeah, I would say five, seven years ago, it, it just kind of came because this is what I thought. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, because I'll admit when you read my book, when I was younger, I was just not making the best of choices. Mm -hmm. And I was causing my, my struggles, you know, but by my choices. And so I thought, okay, but as I get older and I'm making better choices, that means struggles go away, right? I'm a better person. Mm -hmm. And so as I got older and I'm, life is going on and I'm making really good choices and, and I feel like I'm a good person, all these things, I'm like, my struggles did not go away. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought they were going to go away. The more, like the better choices, that, and they're different, right? We deal with different struggles, you mm -hmm. know, um, but struggles are just, part of life. Everybody will have them, you know, regardless of who you are or how big of a heart you have or how much money you make. They're different person to person for sure, but we're all going to have them. And so I just kind of started like learning a little bit more about them. I started being more intentional when I would go through them. I would rate them mm -hmm. like I would rate them as far as, okay, I probably could have dealt with that better. I would give myself from, you know, a one to five or one to 10, I, okay, maybe a seven. But what can I improve if I ever go through that again? What, what should I do different? And so I just started being intentional because I realized some struggles were repeating mm. and repeating struggles. I'm like, if this struggle keeps repeating, why is it repeating? <gasps> I'm not learning what I need to, to get it off of repeat. So really just, just realizing that oh, it doesn't matter how good you are. I'm still going to have them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm always going to have them throughout my life, now I don't have them every day because yeah. that's not healthy to have struggles <laughs> every day. We probably need to learn and grow if we're having yeah. them every day. But every year I have them. And sometimes I am good for four months and then I have one. And sometimes I'm good for two weeks and then I have one. You know, it's different. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're not going to go anywhere and no matter how good a person I am, I'm still going to have them. Might as well learn about them. Might as well use them instead of letting them use me. Because I think for a really long time, I did let them use me. I became the victim, right? Mm. And that's just, that is not cute. Being a victim isn't cute. It's not who I am to my core. And so it's either be used by your struggles and become a victim or use them to become better. And I just said, I'm done. It is time to use my struggles to really grow and become better. Mm -hmm. That's so good. <laughs> and that leads me into... Um, the upstruggle formula that you have in your, in your book. So can you tell us a little bit more what that formula is and how it can be used to become stronger and live happier? Absolutely. Okay. So, and I have my notes because believe it or not, even though I came up with a formula with sometimes I have struggles, like in January, I had one really big one. Mm -hmm. um, and you read that the last yeah, chapter, that I was did. my really big one. I ran and I'm like, where's my formula? I'm not using my formula. Oh my goodness. And so I keep it written so that I, I still use it, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I have it. So I'll share that. So I have what I just, I discovered there were three universal struggles that everybody is going to go through everybody. Mm -hmm. And I discovered it through a reflection of my own struggles, trying to categorize them, watching other people struggle. I'll, I'll be honest. And, and some research. And so I discovered that and I, I kind of just named them, sorry, my puppy. I kind of just named them myself. I labeled them mm -hmm. myself. And so the first one I call self, just meaning self-inflicted pain by one's own choices. That, when I was younger as a teen, a lot of my struggles came through that. Even as a young adult, a lot of my struggles came through that. Um, the second one is called others mean pain inflicted on us through the actions of others. That is a real thing. I really believe it is. You know, um, my husband leaving me when I was sick, that inflicted a lot of pain on me. Um, Somebody's having a good time. <laughs> she, gets a, she gets a little crazy sometimes. Um, and so that is a real thing. But what I've come to find out through, you know, talking to people is a lot of people actually want to put their struggles there mm -hmm. and they want to, it's because it's easier to point the finger, right? It's easier to blame. It's easier for all this, all these things. And I'm like, okay, well, hold on. If you think all your struggles belong in that category, 
why are you choosing to hang out with people who cause you so much pain? Mm -hmm. So really, isn't that a choice you're making to surround yourself with those people? So really your struggles fall under self because you're making those decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the third one I call life, just pain inflicted on us through, um, just because of life, through no one's actions, like my cancer. I didn't cause that. Uh, my mom didn't cause that. Nobody yeah. caused the cancer. Sometimes like hurricanes, right? I'm from Houston, Texas. Um, the Harvey, Hurricane Harvey. Like nobody causes that. It's just a life struggle. But, and so we don't have control over those mm -hmm. ones, but we can always control how we react and how we respond to those struggles. <clears throat> of course, even with others, right? We don't have control of, of, you know, you could, there could be a drunk driver who gets behind the wheel and kills a loved one. You have no control over that, yeah. right? But we still have control, not saying that it's hard or we shouldn't feel pain and mourn, but we still have control of how we let that um, struggle affect our life, you know? So those are the three categories that we will always have struggles in. Um, but some questions that I have kind of come up with, because I think it's really important to be able to identify which one, mm -hmm. because they are a little different. We're going to approach them differently. The way I think that we're going to work through them is a little different. So for the first one, it's, did I bring this upon myself? Right. Mm -hmm. And that takes letting pride and ego go. We have to ask, did yes, I bring this upon myself? That's a good myself? question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, and a lot of people don't want to ask that because it seems and it's uncomfortable. Yes. But we have to, did I bring this upon myself? And if so, what can I do differently to avoid it in the future? Now, I'm not saying that we should avoid struggle because you can't, you just cannot you avoid can't. struggle. Yeah. We're, we're not. Yeah, you can't. But I'm talking about the ones that we repeat over and over mm -hmm. those ones we can avoid if we just become intentional mm -hmm. and we learn and we grow. Those are the ones. Yes. It's not necessary. Why go through that struggle 10, 20, 30 times when if we just stop and think about our choices that we're making, you can avoid all that pain, right? Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and the other one is did, you know, it's just a simple question. Did somebody else bring this upon me? Mm -hmm. And if so, what can I do differently? I have found that oftentimes when it's somebody else, whether it's a toxic family member who is just negative and gossipy, and that's uncomfortable for me. I'm, I'm just no longer that woman. I was, I'll admit, I used mm -hmm. to be that woman, but I'm not anymore. Um, or whatever the pain is. And so I just, the three things I like to do is, okay, let's have a conversation with them and let them know, you know what, that's just not acceptable in my life. And I was talking to my daughter who has moved out and she's actually married. She's my oldest. And she was telling me about an experience she had. Um, and her husband was saying, well, he just doesn't like confrontation. And that's why he hasn't spoken up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There is a difference in boundaries mm -hmm. and having a conversation with someone and saying, this is not acceptable and confrontation. And I think people get those two confused. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm saying, look, I'm sorry, but that is not okay. That's not confrontation. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we have to know the difference. And I get some people are just so sweet and everything like I don't want No, this is your life. Mm -hmm. It is okay to say that is not okay in my life for you to do that. So we have to have those conversations. And I know sometimes it's hard for us to have those conversations. I get it, but we have to. Um, sometimes we just need to put some distance, right? Yes. Love from afar. Setting boundaries is always, always the way to go. Having conversations and yeah. then setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And loving people from afar is, um, you know, I feel like our friends, you really get to pick and choose your friends. Mm -hmm. When it comes to family, your family is your family. And it doesn't give them a right to be mistreat us. It doesn't give them a right to any of that. But, and if family is so toxic and you can just cut them out completely, there's kind of different, you know, situations. That's why we would do certain things. But sometimes we just have family members that we love them and they're, they're good people, but they're, they're negative and it yeah. brings us down or they have nothing kind to say, or they jab at us. And it's like, okay, I love you. And for the most part, you're a good person but you don't add value. You don't lift me up. You just always jab and put me down. I'll see you once a year at that Christmas party for two hours. And that is okay. Yeah. Right. Distance. 
put distance between you and the people who are just so toxic. And then, like you said, the boundaries, that is a huge one. We have to set boundaries. I still to this day set boundaries, you know, with my daughter being a newlywed, she often calls us and will text us and is what about this? And what about that? And I'm like, Ellie, y'all need to set, set boundaries with these certain family members. Now, Set that expectation now. Don't wait till you've been married for 10, 15 years and then you want to all of a sudden set boundaries. You have to do it now. And she's kind of got more of my personality, a little bit more of a stronger, like, I don't think so. You know what I mean? And her, <laughs> hus her husband is a little bit more like, hey, he's sweet, but I don't know. And I'm like, Ellie, stand your ground. It is okay to be kind and be sweet and have a backbone, okay? And yes. I, taught, I raised you to be a strong woman. You keep just setting those boundaries. And she's like, yeah. Um, cool that I know this is so off topic but it's just so neat that you know raising these kids she really was a tough one to raise and she thought we were terrible and we were strict and how dare us have these boundaries and she was a rule breaker and a rule bender <laughs> and now she's coming back around and she's like um now I get why you said that um now I get why you <laughs> set boundaries and I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> we, we did it right. We did yeah. it right, you know. Yeah. So it's just neat to have those conversations with yeah. her about boundaries and stuff. Um, but then, like we talked about already, that the life, right? The third one, we don't have control over it happening because it's just a life, right? Mm. But we can control how we respond to it. So those are the three universal struggles that we're all going to have struggles from. Um, and it's really important to know which one we're dealing with. So we can approach it the right way. Mm. That's what I share. Yeah. I mean, that, that is yeah. so good. When you put it in this way, you have like three categories. Uh, I think it's so much easier for uh, someone who is listening to categorize those those struggles mm -hmm. and then choose how they can react and how to, um, to approach them. Yeah. So, yeah. That is, that is really really awesome. And, and it's, that's why I loved your book because it has so many uh, practical tips. It's, it's yeah. really, really good. Love it. Oh, thank you. Um, um, right now we are going as well through kind of a weird time globally <laughs> due to this Corona pandemic and businesses are suffering and, uh, a lot of people are losing jobs and they're uh, going through struggles. So what would you say, what would be the three mindset um, shifts or what mindsets they should adopt to grow through a struggle instead of going through a struggle? Yeah, so what the one mind shift that I think is really important, and I talk about it in my book, is I mentioned, look, if you can't adopt this mindset, then just forget it. Because unless we adopt a certain perspective or mindset on it, we're just never going to believe it, right? Mm -hmm. And so the mindset that we all have to adopt about struggles is that they're for us, not against us, right? Mm -hmm. That they're not the enemy, that, that, that they're really there so we can grow. It's kind of like, you know, I do most of my growing when I've experienced a hard struggle. Mm -hmm. That is when I can really work on my, develop my character. That is when I learn. That is when I grow. It's kind of like working out because I teach group fitness, right? We have to get our bodies really uncomfortable to get change. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that I'm like, you, yes, y'all, we're going to get uncomfortable for the next 45 minutes or whatever class I'm teaching. Know that that is okay, that is good, and we need that to create change in our body. And I'll tell them, and just like outside the studio, we have to get uncomfortable to grow as a person. So really the mindset is, it, it, it's just adopting that as truth, right? If we can mm -hmm. adopt that as truth, then we're not, we're not going to do anything else that I mentioned in the book. And so it's just adopting that perspective, which it doesn't mean that struggles that we face aren't going to be hard. Or, well, because I have a good understanding. And no, they are still, you're still going to go through things that are really hard. Um, but that mindset and perspective, I think is a healthier one. Mm -hmm. And it really is true. There's so much truth to it. It's not like I'm saying you guys believe in, you know, fairy dust and unicorns and rainbows. You know, it's not anything like that. There's just so much truth to it. And there are studies and research um, behind all of that as well. So that's the mindset 
that they have to adopt. Yeah, that, that is, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And it's, you know, as you said, uh, even when you're working out, you're, you're, you have to be uncomfortable to create the change to, mm -hmm. uh, to grow. So it's the same yep. thing in life. So we just yep. have to approach it see which category it belongs, decide how to react to it, and just yep. use this as opportunity to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. So Tracy, can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on for you right now? So you have written this book. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next for you? What are you working towards? Oh my goodness, there's so many things going on. Um, <laughs> so obviously the book, you know, still doing that, still doing podcasts and stuff like this. I do have another book in me. It's a relationship marriage book, which I actually started writing before Up Struggle, mm -hmm. but I speak on struggles. And so I'm like, wait, it doesn't even make sense to speak on struggles when you're writing a book on marriage. So I put it to the okay. side to make sense. Um, so I do have that one and I actually have quite a bit written for that one as well. So I have that book that'll be coming out. I don't know exactly when, yeah. um, when it's on my heart, when I feel like it's ready to, you know, time to, to publish it, I will. But so I do have another book in me. Um, I am present on social media over on Instagram and TikTok, doing stuff over there that I'm working on all the time. Um, goodness, I'm still, you know, speaking, like speaking events, I'm slowly starting to, you know, because things are slowly starting to open back up where we can get out. Um, so starting to slowly book speaking events. So I'm a, I am a speaker and I do like to go speak and stuff. Um, and I did just start coaching. So, uh, doing my whole book thing, I kind of actually put a course together, but I never really launched it. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do a course or if I actually want to coach one-on-one. -on -one. So I actually am coaching people one-on-one -on, -one on how to take their book from idea to reality in 90 days and how to hit Amazon bestseller. So I do that. Wow. So I'm coaching and speaking and, you know, podcasts and social media. Um, and I know I've got another book in me. So there's just <laughs> all kinds Amazing. of Amazing. And I think it's like who... I highly recommend for everyone who wants to read this book, go on Amazon. Is that the best place to yep. get this book? Just yep. go on Amazon, uh, either type in Tracy Farin or Upstruggle or both mm -hmm. and get this book. Tracy is someone who is multi-passionate. You've done so many things in your life and you have so much energy in you. So I really, um, look forward for that second book and for all the other things that, are, that you're going to bring into this world. So if oh, our you. listeners would like to connect with you, where can they do that? So the, as far as social goes, the best way is Instagram, which is just Tracy Farron and, um, and TikTok would be Tracy D Farron, or they can shoot me an email at hello, Tracy .com. I keep it simple. I know. Yeah. And I see all these other people's usernames. I'm like, you guys, can you just keep your username simple? I can't remember yes. all of that. So really, <laughs> it's, even if they just even if they just Google Tracy Farron, stuff will pop up as well, and, and they can they can find me. But it would be Instagram and TikTok is where I'm most present. Um, and then if they want to drop me an email or my website, Tracy Farron. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for connecting with me and for being on the podcast and talking to me uh, and to our listeners on the Mindset School podcast. I, I absolutely love your energy and, uh, mm -hmm. and I hope that in the future we'll reconnect with your second book and we'll have you on the podcast again. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> If you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with your friends. If you are a social creature, take a screenshot of this podcast, include one insight you learned from this episode, and tag me at Inga Pakal. I cannot wait to see your insights. Also, you might want to check out my free audio guide, How to Get Unstuck, which also includes a workbook. 
you'll learn three simple strategies to generate clarity, regain direction, and feel energized. Simply visit ingapakelnishkite.com or click the link in the show notes. Once again, thank you so much for listening and I'll speak to you next week. Bye now.